Okay, how do I introduce a legend? I don't, just say, great welcome for Mick and Ned Quinn from South Armagh. I don't know whether you know it or not, <coughs> but I'll tell you it now anyway. <laughs> we have a border over an hour. I know the Jews are bordered here too between Scotland and England and Wales and England, but ours is a oh, real border. <laughs> <laughs> Your border makes no difference. <laughs> because there's lots of money to be made smuggling across our border, so whatever way it manage, uh, manages, there's no two things the same price and both sides is always dearer and one side. Hmm. If I ever got to be Prime Minister, but I don't want to be, I would settle the whole thing just have everything the same price and both sides. But way back 1939, in September, the Second World War started. And we were all, if you please know about it yourselves too, with gas masks and rations. <laughs> two ounces of bacon, two <coughs> ounces of butter, and two ounces of lard. We went on down the line like that. But old Maggie Moan came into me mother and she says, Alice, she says, I don't care what anyone says. Man, woman, or child needs at least one good feed in the week to keep the bowels in good order. <laughs> <laughs> and Maggie was a woman that practiced what she preached. <laughs> she went to the post office of a Friday morning and got her, her pension and then they called at that time the rations. She got the rations and came home. <coughs> and on Saturday morning she slung the pan, threw on a lump of the lard and when it was in lovely gravy then she would throw on the bacon and get the bacon. The bacon, you see, didn't, there was no bacon slicer, there was no electricity that time we're out in the country, any. The, we had a bacon slicer, the first bacon slicer came into Mullaban. It was one, Ben McCardle had it, and he had the post office. And it was there, and there was a big wheel on it. And you'd be putting round the big wheel like that, but the one that cut the bacon would be going, let it go. <laughs> and he had a lovely wee girl that was working in the post office for him. And he wanted her to be able to serve in the shop and do the post office when he wouldn't be there. And he took her up how to show or how to slice the bacon. And there wasn't, but the war on things were frightened. There wasn't that much bacon. But when he was tightening the thing over, he took that finger off just like that. And it didn't come off straight across. It came off that. <laughs> Someone said it was great for picking his nose. <laughs> <laughs> he was then in the hospital for six weeks, getting it sorted out. And he come back home, and old Henry Goddardly was across the road and never got in to see his neighbour in the hospital, and he went over for to see him. And he went in and down and welcomed him home. Oh, Jesus, to see Henry, it happened the simplest ever you seen. Come up, I'll show you how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> he took Henry up for to show him how it happened and took the next <laughs> And the bacon slicer was put into cold storage on the bend day. <laughs> the bacon come that time, just, the, the, it was like the way you'd get the plug at the back of your two ounces of bacon. Uh, the, the, uh, <coughs> the man would come at his neck and close the grass. And all go away, all you get on the back of the front. And that's only sixpence a piece. And I am in the sand car. It was a couple of years ago, anyhow. <laughs> 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 was up on the mountain had no lane up to it. The donkey would walk up the way it would be half up to it. And if you were on the mountain, uh, you always called in to see how Dan was. And there came a, ho a hailstone shower, and I run with me ferret as hard as I could to get in. And just as I was going to the door, the hailstones was up on that height at the door. And in I got and closed the half door, and Dan was sitting at the fire, and I said, that's a bad day, Dan. No, says he, <clears throat> lad, it's not a bad day. There's no such a thing as a bad day, you know, he says. I says, how do you make that look out there? He says, yesterday is past and gone. It's no good to you or me. Tomorrow we might never see it. So this is the best day in your life. Come up here, he says, to the fire for I'm house training the young cat the day. <laughs> I went up to the fire and Dan was there and he had a chair with no back on it and a stick. And just at that, you think you heard it, the 
the poor wee cat over at the table, put a hump on him at the table. And Dan just lifted the stick like this and he fired it. He took the cat along the ring, he went round round the house and he saw the half door, jump out over the half door, and Dan says to me, house train. <laughs> Lovely big sheep dog that loved it. Sheep dog sat at his boots looking up into his face and the tail going like that. That was the only part of Dan's floor was clean. <laughs> the lovely big white cat, the mother of the one that he was training, was laying on the hard stone out full stretch sleeping. And the two goats were sitting here beside the chair chewing their coat. <laughs> And he had the table beside him, and he had everything on that table. He hadn't to get up to get any. Everything was there that he wanted. He had a wee, just a three-corner place to put his plate on and where he would eat. And he had a jug, and the, <coughs> it was one of those uh, Delft jugs. And he came in some day, and as he was coming in on the door, wasn't the cat just put her head down into the jug. And he saw it and shouted, and the poor cat jumped without ever taking her head at the jug or on the jug landed on the half stone smashed the whole lot. He never bought another jug. Whenever he wanted milk on his porridge he called whatever goat was in milk at the table. <laughs> <laughs> and there was no voice in those cut down hygiene and all that stuff. <laughs> but whenever before the war there was no problem at all. Whenever Dan was a man who left plenty of butter on his bread. And it was the farthest that was baked on the griddle that and, and cut on four. And Dan split his farther down the middle, put about a half an inch of butter on the two sides of it and left it there. And he'd be eating away. But now and again, it would fall onto the floor. Well, if it fell with the side with no butter on it down, all he had to do was lift it up and just rub it in the leg of his throat. <laughs> leave it on the table, perfect. But when it fell with the butter side down, with goat's hairs and cat's hairs and dog's hairs, and as you might say, other things too numerous, <laughs> when it was left up on the table, you'd think it was an animal, you'd expect it to walk. <laughs> but there was no problem, because the war wasn't on at this time, and Dan would just lift the knife, close one knee, and go down about a quarter of an inch, and just do that. <laughs> But now the war was on, bread ration, butter, all he could do was put a wee skin of butter on the bread. It still lifted as much off the floor when it fell. But <clears throat> now and again it would fall the other thing. Why didn't it always fall the other thing? Why at the nine times out of ten did it fall with the butter thing there? Well, he put in a whole fortnight trying to work this out. Why did the bread fall with the butter side? Go in there on the me, and when the two of us gets on it, he says, we come up with an apple. And he landed over with Mickey, and went up to the door, shouts, I in, Mickey. And when Mickey heard Dan, he couldn't believe it. He got up to meet him, but when he was walking, just the way he was walking. Ah, oh, my God. Says, says Dan, what's wrong, Mickey? Have you corns or have you chilblains or what? <laughs> no, says he, Dan. I had the awfulest accident, he says, that any man could have, he says, about six months ago, he says. And come up till I tell you, he says, I would have he says. Since the war started, he says, the tobacco down here, you can't smoke it. I do cross up the border into Dundalk and I get the Mick McQuaid tobacco and Lord, there's a lovely smell of it. And I'm smoking Mick McQuaid tobacco all the time. This day I was in Dundalk and says I, I'll go in and I'll get a, a half a pound of steak. There's no rationing up there. And when I went into the butchers, he was there walking and he had a table and a pile of pink stuff on it. And I was over and I says, what's that? So see, that's a new thing that's out now, he says, to call them sausages. <laughs> and I says, can you eat them? Oh, there's one or two of them. I will say, you just don't buy them that way. Well, says I, whatever way you buy them, like. Well, he says, I sell them with the pound, but my scales is broken. And the way that I make them, he says, I make every one six inches long and there's six of them in the yard. 
so I'm selling them with the yard. <laughs> All I say is I tell you I'm on the bicycle the day and a yard of sausages that have gone down the road, the customs men or the policemen would be on the road and they would take them off me. No, to see you leave it to me. Take off your coat and take off that scarf you have on you, round your neck. And I took off that, I says, and he just lifted the yard of sausage and put it round me neck. Now, he says, he put on your scarf and your coat and button them up. He says, there's not a constant man or a policeman to look at you. And then there's a day. And I'm smuggling sausages, he says, for six months. Well, this morning I got up and it was raining cats and doubts. As I had get round the day, I'll not go. And then I thought I could never make out a whole week without tobacco. And I suddenly thought, doesn't the bus go up on the road and I'll get on the bike over and get on the bus and not get wet at all? And so I did. Got on the bus. The only trouble was the bus had to stop at the customs post and the customs man would come in. Landed in Dundalk and I got me tobacco and once you got the tobacco and took a full, uh, uh, filled your pipe off it, the customs man couldn't touch it. That was for your own use. And as soon as I bought the tobacco, I went down and I was saying to myself, like, one sausage a day is not much good. I could eat two and they wouldn't do me a bit of harm. I'll buy two yards of sausage. <laughs> <laughs> and I went down in and I went up to the man and says, I, I want two yards of sausage. He says, did you see the sign in the window? I says, no. Well, he says, I made a lot of sausages and with the wet days, there's not so many out. And I'm giving me customers a treat. Buy one yard and you get two. You buy two yards, you're going to get four. <laughs> I said, oh, how long now? I says, I'm on the bus today. It stops at the custom post and the man will come in. Four yards of sausage, where would I put them? I said, hey, you leave it to me. <laughs> they got that coat off me. <laughs> And I was standing there and said, gee, I'll tell you what you do, just pull the short off you when you're at it. And so I did. And there I was standing in me short, in me trousers, in me pet nearly, afraid a woman will come in on the door. And the next thing he hands me up, the end of the yard of sausages, and he says, take that in your hand and put it up against your belly. And so I did. And he was holding the rest of it away down there. Now to see turn round. <laughs> Right, 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 right. Tuck the last one up in all. Now you can pull your shirt on you and put your toes back up. And I did. Well, but me being a thin man, you know, it just filled me out, Dan, and I looked like a real good looking man. <laughs> now, Sissy, I've a wee bit of advice for you. Whenever you're coming down to the customs post, Take out the tobacco and start filling your pipe. For there's nothing lowers the blood pressure but <laughs> filling the pipe. <clears throat> and he says, just as the boys come in, strike your match and put up your smoke. And he'll say, there's a man with an easy conscience, he'll never look twice at you. <laughs> I went up and got into the bus, wasn't a thou utility bus with the door at the back of it. And I was sitting in the second seat <laughs> from the front and the world went round <laughs> the custom at the back for I could find the blood pressure raising <laughs> already. And when I looked, there were two great big fat women in the seat opposite me from Belfast. They were up smuggling blankets. <laughs> they were sitting in the seat opposite me and they were looking over at me. And I couldn't understand it then because I wasn't a ladies' man and I wondered why they were looking at me. <laughs> and I, maybe they're not looking at me at all. When I put up the smoke, I looked through the smoke. And I looked through the smoke. There, the two of them was looking at me. But they weren't looking at me face, they were more or less looking at me knees. Well, when I looked down, Dan, wasn't one of the big sausages sticking in. <laughs> I mustn't have closed me trousers. <laughs> but I was there and I had the knife in me hand. You see. <laughs> and just put me, no one looking, I just. <laughs> and I slipped it into me purse. <laughs> and the bus went on. And the big woman from Belfast fainted. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, they were running her and they were clapping her and they were lifting her. And the next thing, the bus pulled up at the customs post. And to tell the truth, on that customs man, he wasn't so bad. He got off the bus and to come in with a cup of water. And when she got a couple of sips of the water, she was up in the seat again and he went away. Never looked at her. <coughs> well, I can tell you, Dan, my face was red. <laughs> and the bus goes on and as it was going on I looks down again and if there wasn't another one <laughs> <laughs> and I still had the knife in me hand again I puts it up and this time Dan I fainted <laughs> <laughs> Now to see that's me story, he says, and I have fucking an awful six months of it. <laughs> well, says Dan, I thought I had a problem coming over to you. And now when I hear what happened to you, I have no problem at all. I'll go home and we'll never think about it. Well, now when you come this far, I'll tell you, tell me what it is, because things like that takes me mind away from me. <laughs> but Dan started to tell him, about the bread and the butter. Oh, yes. And nine times out of ten it fell with the butter side down. But now and again it fell with the side with no butter. Why didn't it always fall with the side with no butter? By God, says he, that's a tough one. I'll tell you what I'll do, he says. I'll lay over the half door here and smoke. He says, I get a bit of ears lay laying over the half door. He says, and there's a pot of potatoes on there, the boiled, uh, the bone pot, there's me and the hens and the duck. And there's sausages there on the pan that I had, <laughs> and you can have a go at them and tell me what you think of them. And Dan sat down at the table, taking the dinner, and he was eating and thinking, and the other man was smoking and thinking. And in about five minutes, Mickey says, Dan, so say I have it. I don't believe you. So quickly. And what is it? You're buttering the bread on the wrong side. Short interval.